Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'll be making a start, at the very least, on my review of The Patriarchs, How Men Came to Rule by Angela Saini. So this is non-fiction. Angela Saini, well, I'll read her uh, bio as well as the blurb, I suppose. She's uh, a very successful journalist. I have a lot of respect for her. Um, I've read some of her other books in the past as well, and this is her newest. Um, so, Dane reads... By thinking about gendered inequality as rooted in something unalterable within us, we fail to see it for what it is, something more fragile that has had to be constantly remade and reasserted. In this bold and radical book, award-winning science journalist Angela Saini goes in search of the true roots of gender depression, uncovering a complex history of how male domination became embedded in societies and spread across the globe from prehistory into the present. Travelling to the world's earliest known human settlements, analysing the latest research findings in science and archaeology, and tracing cultural and political histories from the Americans to Asia, she overturns simplistic universal theories to show that what patriarchy is and how far it goes back really depends on where you are. Despite the pushback against sexism and exploitation in our own time, even revolutionary efforts to bring about equality have often ended in failure and backlash. Saini ends up by asking what part we all play, women included, in keeping patriarchal structures alive and why we need to look beyond the old narratives to understand why it persists in the present. So I'll read you her little bio as well. Angela Saini is an award-winning science journalist and author of three books, including the critically acclaimed Superior, The Return of Race Science, and Inferior, How Science Got Women Wrong. Both are on university reading lists worldwide. She presents radio and television programmes for the BBC, and her writing has appeared in the Financial Times, Wired, and National Geographic. In 2022, she was a Logan Nonfiction Fellow in New York and a resident scholar at the Humboldt Foundation in Berlin. In 2020, Angela was named one of the world's top 50 thinkers by Prospect Magazine, and in 2018, she was voted one of the most respected journalists in the UK. So yes, this uh, this this lady knows her stuff. So she says in the introduction, in the last two centuries, women have reigned as monarchs over Britain for longer than men have, which is very true. I would have thought by quite a lot longer, and purely just because of. Victoria and Elizabeth, right? Just those two alone. Were they, those are the only two queens in that time, weren't they? That shows how long their reigns were. And uh, I think this sum summarises the book quite, quite nicely. Again, this is still in the introduction. She says, Ultimately, this is the story of individuals and groups fighting for control over the world's most valuable resource, other people. If patriarchal ways of organising society happen to look eerily similar at opposite ends of the globe now, this isn't because societies magically or biologically landed on them at the same time, or because women everywhere rolled over and accepted subordination. It's because power is inventive. Gender depression was cooked up and refined not only within society, it was also deliberately exported for centuries through proselytism and colonialism. So here is some information about kind of what we see out there in the uh, in the animal world. Male domination is certainly common in the animal kingdom. It's seen among chimpanzees, for instance. Most people do think patriarchy is a given, says Amy Parrish, but it's not a hard and fast rule. The more researchers look in detail, the more variation they find. Female leadership is seen not just amongst bonobos, but also among killer whales, lions, spotted hyenas, lemurs, and elephants. And this is very telling as well. Um, so, um, she's talking about Duval. What's his name? What's his full name? Uh, so, primate expert Franz Duval, a professor of psychology at Emory University. And um, we get... It's sort of interesting for me as a man to write about gender and bonobos because I think if a woman would write about the things that I write about bonobos, she would probably be dismissed, he adds. Even fellow primatologists have been reluctant to accept the existence of a clearly female-dominated species. Once, while giving a lecture in Germany about the power of the alpha female bonobo, de Waal recalls, at the end of the discussion there was a German professor, an older man, who stood up and said, what is wrong with those males? He clearly felt they should be dominant. So we get some arguments for and against. We have matriliny and patriliny. Um, basically, you know, whether things get passed down from man to man or woman to woman. Um, so on the subject of matriliny, some have claimed, for instance, that it can exist only among hunter-gatherers or simple agriculturalists, not in larger scale societies. Others say that matriliny works best when men are away at war for most of the time, leaving women in charge. Many argue that as soon as people start keeping cattle or other big animals, matriliny ends because men want to control those resources. Even more have claimed that land or property ownership automatically brings patriarchy for similar reasons. The very existence of these explanations assumes that societies that land on matriliny are unusual cases, beset by special strains as fragile and rare, possibly even doomed to extinction, the Washington State University anthropologist Linda Stone has written. 
In academic circles, the problem has its own name, the matrilineal puzzle. Patriliny, on the other hand, is seen to need no explanation at all, it just is. And we get this, this sentence which I thought was interesting. Uh, for Asante people in Ghana, leadership is divided between the Queen Mother, a position she holds in her own right, not because she is anyone's mother or wife, and the male chief, whom she has a role in selecting. But surely by the very nature of the fact that she is the Queen Mother, she is selected by virtue of being the mother. And this, is, I think, is true and actually is a kind of a hopeful note. Nowhere in the world are people not pushing for their societies to be structured differently, for the marginalised to have more freedoms or privileges. Anyone given half a chance will prefer equality and justice to inequality and injustice, writes the political theorist Dan Phillips. Subservience does not, on the whole, come naturally to people. We generally don't submit to power or aggression without resistance. And she ends chapter one with this sort of power, powerful short paragraph. The most dangerous part of any form of oppression is that it can make people believe that there are no alternatives. We see this in the old fallacies of race, caste and class. The question for any theory of male domination is why this one form of inequality should be treated as an exception. So um, I'm going to get this name wrong but this is, we learned about Native American tribes and their approach to you know, matrilineal. In a 1900 edition of the Journal of American Folklore, the ethnologist William Martin Beauchamp, who had spent time with the Horde and Asani, described a condolence song that revealed just how much harder it was for the community when a woman passed away than when a man did. It was seen as being worse even than the death of a chief, he wrote, because with her the line is lost. When indigenous people began learning English after colonization, he added, they would routinely speak of a man as she and a woman as he. They swapped the pronouns, consciously or subconsciously, because they could see that he represented the most important gender in the English language. One teacher noticed that when learning the Bible, indigenous children would also persistently switch the fifth commandment from thy father and thy mother to thy mother and thy father. And this is fascinating too. Like many matrilineal societies, there isn't a simple reverse of patriliny. Only relatively recently have Western scholars begun to appreciate the complexity of gender in some indigenous traditions. We have the discussion of a third gender in the creation stories, which is the person that is called a nadlihi, or a third gendered person, explains Dena Dahl. This was the person who displayed skills and talents of being a negotiator and a mediator between men and women, usually dressed as a feminine person. There are others who believe their forebears recognise four, five, or perhaps more manifestations of gender, which they suggest might correspond to something like gay, lesbian, feminine man and masculine woman. The indigenous term two-spirit has also resurfaced into common usage to recapture this old concept of fluidity beyond the gender binary. And I just thought this was interesting stuff about um, the idea of uh, housewives. Um, a lot of like people, even today still, their ambition is to be a housewife, you know. The domestic housewife had from the very beginning only ever been an aspiration for the wealthiest. Until slavery ended, it was a labour of enslaved men, women and children that afforded rich white women the luxury to avoid work at all. Small surprise that by the middle of the 20th century, it had become a middle class status symbol. It was the only ambition I ever had, the actress Doris Day is reported to have said. Not to be a dancer or Hollywood movie star, but to be a housewife in a good marriage. If a man earned enough for his wife to stay at home, he was judged to be doing well for himself. Employers assumed that when a woman got married, she would give up work. The same is true across the West. In the UK, a marriage bar introduced in the interwar years to protect male employment rates meant that women in professions such as teaching and the civil service were forced to resign after getting married. Britain's Foreign Office didn't abolish the marriage bar until 1973. This was how educated women in the 1950s found themselves channeling their energies into housekeeping, shaping what we now recognise as the stereotype of the chirpy, manicured, suburban wife and mother. And the problem is, is that this is still held up as an ideal and yet obviously wages haven't kept pace with inflation and house costs and things like that. So now the man and the woman both have to work and they're still going to struggle to raise kids. And here we learn about, you know, the sort of idea of non-intersectional feminism and, and white women, middle class white women arguing for their rights but not necessarily for the rights of, of others. Um, even those who saw themselves as friends of the Indian, those who sought to reform government policy, saw native people as essentially children, undeveloped primitives newly born into American culture, observes Melissa Ryan at Alfred University in New York, who researches race, class and gender in American literature. 
Matilda Jocelyn Gage, for instance, for all of her support of Native American rights, veered between celebrating Horde and Asawani societies for their matrilineal traditions on the one hand, and admitting how backward she found them on the other. This was an attitude among some white suffragists that extended to black Americans and immigrants too. Gage's language implies that the juxtaposition of voting barbarians with disenfranchised white women is an outrage not just to women, but to the principles of civilization itself. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who famously spoke on the first morning of the Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, also believed that it was better and safer to enfranchise educated white women than former slaves or ignorant immigrants, writes Elizabeth Griffith in her biography of Stanton. When the social reformer and abolitionist Frederick Douglass, who had been an outspoken supporter of women's suffrage from the start, told a meeting in 1869 that there was an urgency to black suffrage because of the brutal murders and persecution that black men were suffering in some states, Stanton betrayed her prejudices by telling him, if you will not give the whole loaf of suffrage to the entire people, give it to the most intelligent first. We get a reference of Gobleco Tepe, which is interesting because I was uh, learning about that on the YouTube channel Geographics by Simon Whistler. I've been binging on his channels recently, as you do. So here, uh, I just want to read out a couple of paragraphs here um, on the idea of what, or sort of, in, it investigates some of the reasons why maybe um, uh, the patriarchy was created, you know. Poorer women and enslaved women, as well as children, have been expected to work outdoors throughout history, and this is a tradition that continues to this day. On reporting trips in the last decade, I've interviewed women farmers and manual labourers in India and Kenya, sometimes working with infants strapped to their backs in slings. United Nations data shows that today, women make up almost half the agricultural workforce and nearly half of the world's small-scale livestock managers in low-income countries. The idea that women are physically incapable of agricultural labour simply isn't borne out by the facts. The American activist and scholar Angela Davis has written of slavery in the United States. Since women, no less than men, were viewed as profitable labour units, they might as well have been genderless as far as the slaveholders were concerned. Pregnant women and those with infants were still expected to work. Under slavery, she explains, women were the social equals of men. Shadal adds that female slaves did heavy agricultural work such as hauling logs and ploughing with teams of mules and oxen. In response, some researchers have argued that maybe it wasn't agriculture in general that changed the status of women, but a particular type of agriculture, the kind that uses a plough. Hoe cultivation, done by hand, tends to be seen in more egalitarian communities according to some studies. Farming with ploughs, which uses domesticated animals and needs relatively more upper body strength, is often seen in more male dominated ones. But again, this isn't a blanket rule, and given that not all men are physically stronger than all women, and an individual's physical strength varies over their lifetime, neither can it be expected to be. Indeed, women have worked outdoors in some plough societies. Scheidel quotes one 19th century traveller to Europe's Basque country, observing that the women there showed themselves quite as good as the men at working in the fields. They harnessed the oxen and led them. They drove the cart to the market or the plough along the furrow. The lives of everyday folk in rural areas, Steidel suggests, has rarely matched up to the cultural ideals or assumptions of wealthier people in the cities. And we learn a bit about women in warfare. Uh, women warriors didn't just come from the ranks of the social elites. When ordinary women have been given the opportunity to fight and battle, many have taken it. Toller notes that in the 20th century, thousands of women joined the revolutionary guerrilla armies of Africa, Asia and Latin America, making up perhaps as much as 30% of these forces. Starting in 2014, she adds, between 7,000 and 10,000 Kurdish women joined the battle against the Islamist radical group ISIS in the Middle East. Women have also gone to the lengths of disguising themselves as men to be able to fight alongside them. Among the most famous was Deborah Sampson, who fought in the American Revolution in the 18th century under the name Robert Shirtlift. She was seen as so heroic that even after her identity was uncovered following an injury, she was given a full military pension. And this is really interesting and makes a very good point um, that we try and put people into boxes. We know from our own societies that humans are diverse. People come in all shapes and sizes. Individuals can have all sorts of traits and interests and gender manifests itself in multiple ways. Yet we look to historical and archaeological records to do something magical. We expect them to show us worlds in which every single person follows strictly defined social patterns and never deviated from them. Yeah, it's no surprise that we don't find like strictly, high, like, strictly male or female dominant societies given the you know the variety and from one person to another you know 
Now this was quite cool. Uh, there are signs that the rules didn't always sit easily as they were introduced. A state can impose laws, but this doesn't mean that people are happy to follow them. In parts of Mesopotamia, there was a recognition that categories might need to be sidestepped on occasion because they couldn't fully capture individuals' needs. Budin tells me that there were cases in certain cities where men designated their daughters or wives as men so they could give them inheritance rights. A dying father can literally say in his last will and testament that I am making your mother a father of the household or I am making my daughter's sons and they get to inherit like sons, she says. A woman's legal gender was changed to give her a different status within her family. This not only proves the practical limitations of gender categories, but also people's willingness to look beyond them. And then there's another good point made here. Um, she talks about how in ancient Greece, basically to control women, they were married off when they were young, you know? Uh, and she writes, the effect of marrying off girls so early to older men is that wives and husbands must have seemed utterly different from each other in their behavior and temperament. A child might be expected to run a busy household for an adult who was as much as 10 or 15 years older than her. These paternalistic relationships fed the impression that women were foolish and immature and men rational and wise, when in fact it was just their age differences that made it appear that way. Single line here that is possibly one of the truest lines I've read in this. Um, I mean, I'm not a royalist, so maybe that's why, but it says, um, nothing demonstrates the insecurity of Europe's monarchies quite as much as their need for pomp and ceremony. And that is very true. We get a reference to Spartan women and uh, along with the lines of, uh, along with this as well, in which, um, you will recognize if you've seen the movie 300. When one Spartan was told that the arrows of a powerful opposing army would darken the skies above them, he's said to have replied, good, we'll fight in the shade. Says uh, it wasn't just men who were known for these one-liners. There are around 40 preserved phrases like these that have been attributed to women from Sparta. Um, says the women expected their husbands and sons to go out and fight, even at risk of death shows just how invested they were in the military aims of the state. The most graphic one is the mother who hitched up her dress and said, do you plan to creep back in here where you emerged from when her son had shown cowardice in battle? There are stories of girls mocking boys for their weakness and of daughters and wives telling their fathers and husbands what to do. Uh, it was also mentioned in here that Spartan women were said to give birth standing up. And here we have some um, stuff on um, transgender women as well. Uh, transgender women are women, we all know this. I imagine Angela Saini knows this, she seems like an intelligent woman. Um, and she says, um, there remain cultural differences in how societies think about what makes a person a man or a woman. A case in point is the way in which sexual reassignment surgery for transgender people is treated by the Roman Catholic Church and the Islamic Republic of Iran today. Both are rigidly patriarchal and view men and women as having clearly defined social roles. But while the Catholic Church regards being transgender as a kind of mental instability requiring psychological treatment, the Islamic Republic sees it as a physical issue that should be corrected by surgery. The Iranian state even subsidizes sexual reassignment operations in the belief that this will bring a person's body and mind into correct alignment with each other. Transgender men and women in Iran, after these operations, are expected to meet the moral and social obligations consistent with their gender. For transgender women, this includes wearing a veil in public. For the Catholic Church, on the other hand, a post-operative transgender man is still a woman. Get this terrifying statistic here. Of more than 40 million people living in modern slavery worldwide, at least 15 million are in forced marriages. And uh, she makes a powerful argument here. She says, uh, parallels such as these may point to how rules and norms around marriage evolved over time in certain patrilineal, patrilocal societies. Perhaps it wasn't the subordination of women that originally provided the model for slavery and other forms of oppression. Maybe instead it was the practice of slavery that slowly came to inform institutions of marriage. Cameron estimates that at one stage, captives may have made up to around 30% of the population of ancient Greece, 10 to 20% of Roman Italy, 15 to 20% of many early Islamic states, and as much as 50 to 70% of Korea before the 17th century. In Scandinavia, a 12th century farm may have typically had three slaves, she writes. According to the Doomsday Book, which surveyed the population of some of England's settlements in 1086, the proportion of slaves in the country may have been around 10%. The first United States census in 1790 showed that for every 100 free white people in the American South, there were 53 enslaved people. That is insane. I get this again, more terrifying shit. The socialist feminist Sheila Robotham has written that among peasant families in Russia before the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, it was customary for the bride's father to give the groom a new whip so he could exercise his authority if he wished. Peasant women, she adds, were often sold to the highest bidder. We get the terrifying idea that when a farmer couldn't afford to hire a domestic worker, he took on a wife because she would do the jobs for free. 
and we learn about uh, female genital mutilation, awful practice. It says, according to the World Health Organization, at least 200 million women and girls alive in the world today have undergone female genital mutilation, with a further 3 million at risk every year. Yet the practice is often instigated by mothers and aunts. And now we learn about how sort of communism and socialism and the Soviet Union affected uh, the patriarchy. Uh, some ways it was a good thing, in some ways not so good. Um, but we have, um, so what have we got here, Lenin declaring at the first All Russia Congress of Working Women in 1918, he says, one of the primary tasks of the Soviet Republic is to abolish all restrictions on women's rights. And that's precisely what the government began to do. One of the first political changes that the leadership introduced when it took power in Russia was to put women on an equal legal footing with men, notes historian and political scientist Archie Brown. In 1917, all women were given the right to vote, a year before any women in Britain, and three years before any in the United States. Civil marriage replaced religious marriage. Divorce was made easier and cheaper. In 1920, Soviet Russia became the first country in the world to legalize abortion. I think I tabbed some more about um, how uh, the Soviets affected patriarchy as well. Uh, and we actually see lasting effects. So we get today, while Western Europe and the United States continue to struggle with some of the lowest rates of women in science, engineering, and technology in the world, the same problem does not exist in parts of Central and Eastern Europe. The international scientific journal Nature reported in 2019 that when judged by the proportion of published papers authored by women, Central and Eastern European universities were among the best in the world when it came to gender balance. Poland's Medical University of Lublin and University of Gdansk came first and fourth. The University of Belgrade came third. By contrast, Harvard University came 286th and the University of Cambridge 537th. So she's talking to one of her sources here and we get... Watching the screen adaptation of The Handmaid's Tale, Margaret Atwood's dystopian novel about a patriarchal religious state, Alinejad saw immediate parallels with Iran. This is a fiction in the West, but this is my reality. This is our daily life. And indeed, Atwood has said, one of the things I saw, I think it was Murphy Napier here on Booktube, she did a review of The Handmaid's Tale where she said it like wasn't believable um, and she didn't think it could happen. And the scary thing is, is that everything that Atwood wrote into The Handmaid's Tale and uh, The Testaments, she deliberately chose things that have happened somewhere in the world. It's kind of like I did with my, my factory farming novel, Meat. All of the stuff that happens in Meat doesn't all happen on any one given factory farm, but it all happens in various places around the world. And that's what happened in the, with The Handmaid's Tale. And I thought this was interesting, here we get, there's no single moment when patriarchal values decisively won. Instead, what we see all the way through history is resistance. As the Brooklyn-based author Gal Beckerman has written, change, the kind that topples social norms and uproots orthodoxies, happens slowly at first. People don't just cut off the king's head. For years and even decades they gossip about him, imagine him naked and ridiculous, demote him from deity to fallible to mortal. And this is kind of shocking, it shows some of the sort of internalised, um, patriarchal values that some people some people have um, in the process the unthinkable becomes thinkable the practice of female genital mutilation sometimes referred to as female circumcision has often been supported by older women who want to make sure their daughters are able to marry but in 2007 when under pressure from the government charities and missionaries our Boer elders living in southern Ethiopia's Rift Valley decided to abolish female circumcision in their community they met with resistance from the girls themselves the social anthropologist Eki Gabbert who happened to be present when the decision was made, documented one teenager's impassioned defence. The culture of our father, our grandfathers, how we originated. We will not give it up, the girl told Gaber. This is our culture and we will not leave it. If our mothers should refuse to continue cutting us, we will cut ourselves. Bleak. A very good point made here. Um, if it's ancient history, tradition, or an unchanging faith that justifies circumscribing women's lives, how is it possible for the patriarchs in the present to define what's acceptable and what isn't? How are they able to bend the past and tradition to their will? Yet women who want greater rights and freedoms cannot do the same. Um, so this is from uh, Fatima Manissi. Um, she it says, uh, liberation starts with images dancing in your little head, she recalls her aunt Habiba telling her as a child. Those images can become words and words and the final thing that I tabbed out here that I wanted to share with you guys is this, just this line, tradition, I come to realise when I think of Kerala, is as we choose to make it. Tradition is just peer pressure from dead people. Anyway, uh, The Patriarchs, How Men Came to Rule by Angela Saini. This is basically like Richard Dawkins' The God Delusion, but uh, for feminism and for smashing the patriarchy, getting rid of gender norms and creating a fairer and more just society. Um, in fact, this actually shows quite often how religion and the patriarchy are intertwined, um, often because of men using religion 
for the purposes of you know um, uh, of encouraging a patriarchy to exist rather than because religion is necessarily um, specifically patriarchal to begin with but yeah lots of food for thought here if you consider yourself a feminist you need to read this book Angela Saini the patriarchs how men came to rule five out of five so that's what I made of the patriarchs by Angela Saini as always don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video hit that subscribe button for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video thanks a lot Bye-bye.